Hey everyone, welcome back to Nintendo Prime. Uh, our stories, we've got three of them for you, are down below in the timestamps. Uh, we are on our road to 80,000 subscribers, so if we can hit 80,000 before January 1st, or at least by January 1st, I want to do something special for you guys, so let's see uh, what happens with that goal. We also are giving away three copies of Pokemon Legends Arceus. Uh, there is a viral sweep link down in the description and or the pinned comet uh, for you to enter for that. We're not announcing that winter until you know, later in January, but still it's gonna be there for you guys to enter. Um, yeah, we have a lot to get into today, so let's just get into our stories. Uh, well, I'm pretty excited for these ones. So our first story is actually a bit of a somber one. Uh, Masahaki Yamura has passed away. If you guys don't know who he is, uh, he was 78 when he passed away. So, you know, at, at the age that you might expect him to. But the thing is, he was actually basically the godfather of the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. So very important in the grand scheme of the history of video games. But I want to read a summary of what he did at Nintendo so you guys can fully appreciate uh, basically his contributions to our childhoods or current new memories we're making maybe on things like the Nintendo Switch online service. So the Famicom, which is the system that would become the Nintendo Entertainment System in the West, was the brainchild of Yamura, who joined Nintendo as an engineer from Sharp in 1972 at a time when it was tentatively exploring the possibilities of electronic entertainment. One of his first roles was to help Nintendo's range of location-based light gun games. When Nintendo Research and Development 2 was created, Yamura was placed in charge, and he was instrumental in the development of Nintendo's color TV game systems, the company's first tentative foray into the realm of domestic video games. There, these were very basic gaming systems that had been relatively crudely built in titles. Yamura began to work on the Famicom in 1981, following a demand from Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamuchi that he create a device capable of playing arcade games on a TV, but with games that came on interchangeable cartridges. Combined sales of the Famicom and its Western counterpart, the Nintendo Entertainment System, was 61.91 million units, and 20 million of those were in Japan alone. Development of the Japan-only Famicom Disk System and the Super Famicom Satellaview, as well as the iconic Nintendo Entertainment System Zapper. It wasn't just hardware that Yumera had a hand in. During his time with the company, he also served as producer on several titles, including Ice Climber, Clue Clue Land, and a trilogy of sports titles with soccer, baseball, and golf. Yamera retired from Nintendo in 2004 and became a professor at Ritz Muken University in Kyoto, and the organization broke the sad news of his passing today. I just wanted to bring up the story so we appreciate basically an unsung legend in the industry. Like everyone knows, you know, basically who created like Pong back in the day. Obviously, we know for Nintendo, Shigeru Miyamoto and the Uchi family's contributions, um, Sakurai, and all of the above. But sometimes, you know, we don't appreciate the unsung sung people that you know he hasn't been at nintendo in some time and because he hasn't been at nintendo in some time i think a lot of people today just weren't even aware of who he was anymore so i just wanted to recognize him obviously my thoughts and prayers go to his family hopefully they're doing well with his passing um he you know seemed to live a pretty full life doing things that he enjoyed um obviously getting to end his career as a college professor so um credit to him and his family and thank you so much for the contributions you have made to both my life and my childhood and millions and millions of others um, and you know what i hope that there's a lot waiting for you in your next life so next up we have sales from uh japan in uh, uh for last week and i i will this is a oddball one for me because on one hand nintendo is basically slapping the competition or basically proving there is no competition to Nintendo Switch in Japan. On the other hand, I, I don't know that it's really a good thing what's happening, but let's just get into the sales numbers from Famitsu for last week. So the Nintendo Switch OLED sold 99,195 units. The base model Nintendo Switch sold 53,752 units. Switch Lite sold 49,990 units. The PlayStation 5 was next with 7,391 units. The PlayStation 5 All Digital was right after that at uh, uh, 
uh, what is it, 1,596 units. Um, Xbox Series X at 435 units. Xbox Series S at, at 198 and PlayStation 4 at something like 80. And the big thing about this that I don't like is that the combined sales of the Nintendo Switch are at 200,000 units. That's incredible. But Nintendo, for the first time in the history of sales charts in Japan, owned 99% of system sales. This is insane to me um, it's incredibly great for nintendo but also a lack of competition in nintendo's home country where nintendo pays a lot of attention could lead to a lack of innovation i know it feels weird saying nintendo lacking innovation really but yeah that's what happens when a company owns a market if they own a market in a monopoly style way which is what's happening with nintendo in japan through no fault of their own by the way it's not their fault sony's not like giving japan units it's not their fault that sony has basically abandoned the japanese audience and it's also not their fault that microsoft's unable to make headway into japan in a more meaningful way so none of it's nintendo's fault but still, a lack of competition is usually a bad thing in every single industry. And while Switch is the number one selling unit, at least like, you know, here in the US, PlayStation 5 took over sales for a month. Um, and we all know Xbox Series is doing really well this holiday season. So it's one of those situations where there's a lot more competition for Nintendo in other territories. And while Japan is obviously not the only market uh, that Switch matters in, it, Nintendo's home country is there and they pay the most attention to that market. So I, I, I do worry about a lack of competition could be for the future of Nintendo. We've obviously had a really light game slate release for the last two years from Nintendo. Uh, would that have existed if there was more competition in their home country? I don't know. Nintendo also dominated the top 10 chart yet again, which they've been doing almost on a weekly basis uh, for like the last year, at least in Japan. Uh, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pro was actually back at number one with 160,000 units. Roughly around 2 million uh, of the of copies of that game is sold in Japan, which is about half the sales of Sword and Shield currently. So we'll see if it can catch up to that over time. But yeah, I don't really want to go over that entire video game chart sales chart because it's just getting kind of samey week over week right there's nothing like incredibly notable that happened in the software sales chart it's just nintendo dominates it again which is no surprise so our very last part of this video is just something i wanted to highlight and feature something i think is really interesting it's fan created uh, but it's fan created in a way that really tickles my fancy because it's related to zelda so there's been a lot of unreal engine 4 um you know kind of a uh, remakes or remasterings or whatever you want to call them of games like Ocarina of Time and also like Mario 64 and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of this stuff, um, you know, is been going on for over a decade. So uh, we don't really talk about it too much. But today, a YouTube user actually put up this video. And this is actually Ocarina of Time's Kakariko Village in Unreal Engine 5. Now you might go, won't Nintendo shut down this project? After all, they did shut down a similar thing that happened with um, Mario 64 when a whole level was recreated in Unreal Engine 4. And to that I say, actually no, Nintendo is likely not going to touch this. The reason that level was taken out is because it was fully playable in a very similar way to the original game. You could destroy enemies. Um, you could obviously play through the level and complete the level. That's not the case here. This is more so just an environment recreation which Nintendo can considers uh, fan art. Um, so since this is considered a fan art kind of thing, yeah. Now, I obviously don't like everything about this Unreal Engine 5 thing, but in particular, Link's model, I think, could use some work. But I mean, it's a fan project. It, the, the brux of it's not really meant to showcase Link. It's meant to showcase the actual world of Kakariko Village in Unreal Engine 5. And then, obviously, imagine the possibilities of Nintendo possibly using Unreal Engine 5 in any sort of game moving forward. Now, I don't think Unreal Engine 5 will realistically be used on Switch, at least the current Switch, maybe a Pro, maybe a switch to but yeah um, I just really like these fan projects and I really wanted to highlight this one full links down in the description to the full video uh, and the full explanation of how he did it you can actually see a little bit of how he created the world and also him thanking his patrons for allowing him to get a beefy enough computer to actually be able to fully create stuff in Unreal Engine 5 because it's not a easy engine to work with if you don't have the hardware that can handle it so yeah i think it looks incredible and i just wanted to feature that today anyways folks i am nintendo rubble jets from nintendo prime one last thing before we go 
Uh, we have launched our Hype Responsibly merch line. Uh, we have some of it in studio now. We got a few pieces. It's obviously gonna be extremely hard to Hype Responsibly with the Game Awards tonight, which by the way, we are gonna be live streaming uh, our own little pre-show beginning at 5 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and then we'll be here for the entire event. I, I mean, I personally will be dipping out for like a 20 minute, half hour period uh, to put my kids to bed. But Eric will be here uh, to help entertain you guys and react to things. And I'll still be watching it on my phone to make sure I don't miss anything. Hopefully like Nintendo's big announcements don't happen conveniently in that period when I'm not available. But uh, sincerely, I wanna thank you guys for all of your support. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, if you didn't catch our podcast last night, I encourage you to go check it out on the Nintendo Prime Podcast channel. In fact, I'll put a link in the pinned comment for you guys to go watch it. We happen to have Tim Geddes on from Kind of Funny Games. It was a really amazing conversation. And it's a great like precursor to the Game Awards tonight because we did talk about the Game Awards there. So if you're looking for some Game Awards hype, but also Game Awards responsibility, and also maybe a little bit of insider information on Jeff Keighley and how much he really cares about um, this video game industry, I suggest you really go give that podcast a listen. Anyways, folks, I am Nathaniel Rubblejans from Nintendo Prime, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.